10 years after the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17, families of the victims continue to seek justice and closure. And for more, more on that, we're now joined by Michael Bosicu. He's a global affairs analyst and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you were one of the first people to arrive at the MH17 crash site it's been 10 long years since then. What can you remember from that experience? Well, thanks for having me. You know, it's it's so sad. It's as if it were yesterday. I feel the same way as many relatives do as well, that even though it's been 10 years, we all remember very vividly what happened. And when we first arrived about 17, 18 hours after that Boeing 777 came down, it was a scene of utter uh, despair and chaos. Uh, the airliner was still smoldering. But you know, Ella, the saddest, saddest thing uh, was all the evidence, all the belongings on the ground, uh, pointing to how many children were on board, about 80, I believe, teddy bears, um, little shoes, uh, soothers, um, <clears throat> all kinds of little clothing. That was, I think, to us, the saddest thing. And, um, you know, the images you're showing right now shows a very strong burn area. That's where the wings and the fuel tanks came down. The temperature is right there, rose, we're told, to about 1,600 Celsius. So a lot vaporized, including some of the human remains. So um, very, very difficult. And just quickly, one has to remember that this was rebel-controlled area at the time, pro-Russian rebel-controlled. And uh, they uh, were very arrogant. They were very pushy. And they made our job very difficult to observe what was happening and also to help create some kind of order from a very chaotic scene. You know, past 10 years from this, I can still feel that the pain from you. We're also listening to victims who all spoke just earlier in our program, sharing their grief, trying to get a closure to this whole thing over here. Investigations into the downing put the blame on two Russians and one Ukrainian. But really, justice has yet to be served. How long more will families of the victims have to wait? Um, <clears throat> sadly, it looks like a long time. I spoke to one of them uh, yesterday, uh, one of the UK relatives whose roots go back to Malaysia. And um, I think she echoed what a lot of people, a lot of relatives feel, is that justice will not be served until two or three things happen, but chiefly that the people responsible are thrown behind bars, as they were, rightly should. But secondly, um, they're looking for a formal apology from the top. In other words, from Mr. Putin. We doubt that will come. And then um, the investigation and media reporting uh, by Bell and Cat and others do suggest that that order to deploy that book missile, that brought the plane down, went all the way up to Mr. Putin. And they also want uh, him held accountable as well. There are a number of other things to uh, compensation. There's a case before the International Court of Human Rights. And one last thing, which is terribly, terribly sad, is that some of them have only received maybe a piece of their loved one's human remains or nothing at all. And some of this, these remains come in drip by drip. So meaning that they're potentially having to have multiple funerals. Um, and you can imagine the the hurt, the pain that all, that also brings. Well, true enough. Um Getting an apology from Russia, it really says a lot about getting a closure to, to this whole saga. But Russia continues to deny responsibility for the laws of lives as it did 10 years ago. Are you hopeful of that changing under current circumstances? Well, yeah. I mean, I was just reminded by that. The Russian embassy here in the Netherlands issued a, a ridiculous statement saying that Russia is not to blame, that their investigation was biased, that sort of thing. But let's try and look for a sliver of light of hope here is that it has happened in previous shoot downs of aircraft that there's been a change of government, a change of heart, and they have apologized and they have um, offered compensation to victims. Um, I don't see that happening under the current regime under Mr. Putin, but suppose there is a change of government in Russia that could happen. The other thing that um, we can have hope for is I think over time, those who are convicted, the three you mentioned, will probably get careless. Maybe they'll take a trip to the Maldives or something, transit through a country which does subscribe to, you know, the international based uh, order and will be nabbed and then spend the rest of their lives behind bars. That will bring, I think, a lot of um, satisfaction, if we can use that word, to, to the relatives. 
Well, Michael, we understand that you have become quite close with relatives of those who died on board MH17. I'm sure you have met them in Netherlands itself. Perhaps you can give us some insight into what they are going through more than a decade since this incident. What would closure possibly really look like for them? Sure. Well, you know, it's been very tough on them, of course, not only emotionally. Um, one of the um, mothers of the victims told me two days ago, it's as if I expect my daughter to walk through the door and go back to her bedroom. She hasn't even touched the bedroom over 10 years. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that needs to be pointed out is a lot of them are going through financial, emotional difficulty. Um, a lot of families could not afford to come here on this important day here in the Netherlands to attend the 10-year ceremony because, you know, they've been coming here over the years. They've been coming to the trial, uh, giving testimony, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I don't want to point blame anywhere, but people know who they are, that um, there, there should be uh, more financial support uh, given to uh, those who lost loved ones on that airplane to be able to do things like proper burials or multiple burials or travel to the Netherlands. Um, they've been let down on a number of fronts. But um, again, it's, it's really, really important, I think, at the end of the day for them to hear the word sorry uttered by the Russian Federation, but also that um, the Russians um, do, uh, put, do, do actually send those three convicted uh, back here so that they can spend time behind bars, but also that um, they open up the investigation, they cooperate, and let's find out once and for all who is ultimately responsible for deploying that very, very deadly machine, the Buk missile. Indeed. So as you've mentioned, the Netherlands and Australia have really initiated other legal proceedings against the Russian Federation. But given that Russia mm -hmm. has basically ignored the Hague ruling, what can we expect to come out of these cases? What weight do these legal challenges really carry? Well, yeah, I mean, if the accused or the charged um, or convicted uh, don't, um, you know, subscribe to these types of processes, it's very, very difficult. Um, Russia has been following its typical playbook, including releasing from the moment that airplane came down, heaps and heaps of disinformation, including right up to today, creating this kind of fog and confusion that even well-educated, savvy people who search MH17 will come up with a lot of conflicting information. Um, but the other thing is, is that, you know, if Russia wants to stop its further isolation that was accelerated by their full-scale invasion of Ukraine, they should also show that they are responsible members of the international community and that they can actually, when, when these types of crimes are committed, hold those responsible and put them forward to justice. That is not happening. In fact, I think it's going the other way. And also, they did not cooperate in the investigation. They didn't provide primary radar data, that sort of thing. So um, one more point I have to make, I think it's really, really important, is that the skies are no longer safer now than they were back then. Um, there are more conflicts going on. There are non-state actors, uh, rebel groups that have much, much more powerful weapons that can go up to altitudes where commercial aircraft are cruising. And um, also airlines and uh, jurisdictions should pay more attention to the severity of these conflicts, the dangers involved, and also closing their airspace uh, when these things happen. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that was Michael Bosikir, Global Affairs Analyst and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council.